Today's video is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Find out how you can get three months for free by clicking on the link in the description box below or going to expressvpn.com slash Kendall Ray. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Sadie just seems insistent on sitting here like this today, so I'm just gonna let her. You keep pulling my shirt down though, bro. This is the last video of 2020. I can't believe it. And I believe I am posting this on New Year's Eve. So happy new year to you all. Happy holidays to you all. I hope you had a nice one. Even though time is a human construct and this whole New Year's thing is kind of, you know, stupid anyway, I do feel like it's a good time to kind of recharge, reflect, renew, and I hope you guys all have some good energy going into the new year. I hope we all have a better year. I know this year has just been so hard for so many, and I wanted to let you guys know you're in my thoughts, and I really do hope 2021 is so much better. What do you think? You are just absolutely ridiculous lately. I swear the camera comes on and she just like wants to get cuteness points. Is that what this is? Cuteness points? That's what this is all about? <laughs> Oh my god, you're so cute. It's definitely working! <laughs> okay, Bugini. Okay. Ready? Go up here. Here you go. There you go. Okay. Can you stay like that? Oh. <laughs> you want Bernie's spot? Okay, we're gonna have to rearrange. Hang on. A few moments later. All right, is everybody comfortable? Also, as many of you probably have noticed, my background continues to change every video. To be honest, the room that I'm recording in is really not ideal. It's a very small, the rooms in my house are really small and it just is hard to get the angle right for YouTube and I'm struggling with this room to like make it work. If you've seen my last couple videos, you've probably seen my shelves and stuff on the wall and I think they look really cool, but in order to have the shelves in the shot, I had to zoom way out and I feel like so far away from you guys. So I had to zoom in, so now it's just green other than a bit of a shelf right here. <laughs> so I don't know, I may be moving out of this spot. The only thing I think I've gotten right is the chair. I'm very happy with the chair, it's a very comfortable 10 out of 10. Everything else I'm still trying to figure out. I'm still really not wild about artificial lighting. I don't know, like part of me just wants to go back to sitting in front of a window. So <laughs> expect the background to change in the next, you know, couple of months. But let's go ahead and get into today's case. This one is super, super interesting. I'm very excited to talk about it today. It's one of those cases where I know you guys are gonna have very different opinions, which is totally fine. Let your voices be heard in the comments as always. But today we are going to be talking about a child as a potential killer, which is always something that is difficult to talk about. And I'm honestly really surprised that this case isn't more well known because it's really interesting how this all happened. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. So today we are going to be talking about Jordan Brown. Jordan was born on August 12th, 1997 in New Beaver, Pennsylvania to his father, Chris, and his mother who was not in the picture. And from the beginning, Chris and Jordan were extremely close. Chris was everything to Jordan. He really looked up to him and vice versa. You know, Jordan was everything to Chris. He was his whole world and he loved being a single father. Not that he loved being single. I mean, that has a lot of challenges, but he loved being a father. He didn't mind the fact that he had to do it by himself because he loved having a son so much. Jordan grew up in an area of New Beaver known as Wampum. And this is a very rural area that's about 40 miles north of Pittsburgh. It's a super, super small town with less than a thousand people living in it. And this area is a very outdoorsy type of area. People who live there are into hunting, fishing, water sports. There's a river that runs right through it. It's very heavily wooded, so people love to go off-roading through it. You know, it's just a very rugged kind of small town feel. And Jordan's upbringing was apparently completely normal. Nothing out of the ordinary had ever happened to him and nothing stood out to anybody as a red flag with him. His dad said that he had the all American childhood and that he was happy and loved. He played baseball and football growing up. He was even the quarterback of his peewee football team, the Warriors. And Chris was actually the coach of this team. So it was a great bonding experience for the two of them. And clearly they were incredibly close and he was just a pretty normal kid. And Chris worked at the shipping department for Steel Light International, which is a local tableware factory. So for a while, Chris was a single dad and he, you know, still loved being a father, but he was missing that partner in his life. 
Eventually he reconnected with someone that he had known when he was younger named Kenzie Hauk. Kenzie was also a single parent, so they really connected on that. You know, there's just so much that they could relate on. And she had two young girls, Janessa and Avalyn. And people who knew Kenzie said that she was a very fiery and fun personality. She was beautiful. She was described as funny, engaging, cared about the ones that she loved. And according to her family, from a very young age, she knew she wanted to be a mom. She was one of those kids that was constantly talking about one day when I'm a mom. And she really, really loved her daughters. And when she came into Jordan's life, you know, she showed that same love to him. Kenzie and Chris started, you know, just by dating. And when that went smoothly for a while, they decided to move in together. This is obviously a big step. I mean, it's blending families. There's a lot of emotions, I'm sure, that had gone into it. But overall, everyone seemed really happy with the change. They actually moved into this really, really cute little farmhouse. And it seemed as if their family family was doing great with the whole blending thing and that the kids were really getting along. Not only that, but her girls loved Chris and Jordan really liked Kenzie a lot. He even started calling Kenzie mom because, you know, his mother wasn't even in his life. Kenzie's family says that she loved Jordan, that she would bend over backwards for him and basically treated him as if he was her son. She was really nice. I liked her a lot. She bent over backwards for him. She had a good relationship with him. Eventually, after they had all moved in together and things had kind of settled, they got pregnant with a child together. This was very exciting for the whole family. You know, the kids were excited to have a new sibling. Chris and Kenzie were excited to see what their child would be like together. They had recently found out that they were going to be having a baby boy and they were going to name him after Chris. His name was going to be Christopher. And like I said, everyone was super excited about this, but especially Jordan because he had always wanted a brother. He was so, so excited to be a big brother and could not wait until the baby was born. I was happy. I was always wanted a little brother. And that's that's what, uh, it was a boy. So that's what I was gonna get. So by February of 2009, Kenzie was eight and a half months pregnant, almost ready to give birth to her new son, Christopher. So that brings us to February 20th, 2009. That morning, Chris said he woke up a little bit late. So he kind of had that like frantic late for work vibe going on. And Kenzie, you know, she was close to having the baby. She's eight and a half months pregnant. And she actually asked if Chris could stay home that day. But he insisted that he had to go to work. He had to be there that day, and he said that he regrets that to this day. Kenzie was really not feeling great that day, so she was still in bed. Chris went in and kissed her goodbye and headed off to work just like any other normal day. So during this time, Kenzie was sleeping in the downstairs basement of the house, and Jordan's bedroom was upstairs. But after the baby came, they were planning to switch rooms so that she could take care of the baby upstairs. This was going to be happening pretty soon. In fact, Jordan had already moved his clothes to the downstairs bedroom that Kenzie he was sleeping in that morning. And according to Jordan, this was a normal morning for him as well. His stepsister, Janessa, actually woke him up for school. He started getting ready like any other day. He got out of bed, went downstairs, and went to the room that his clothes were in, which is where Kenzie was sleeping, the bedroom that he was gonna be moving into. He grabs his clothes and he goes into the bathroom to change for school. After this, he and Janessa were just sitting on the couch together, just relaxing before they caught the bus for school. When the time got closer for them to leave, Kenzie actually told them to go ahead and leave so that they wouldn't miss the bus. They went out of the house like normal, out the back door and down the driveway. The bus just picked them up right in front of the house and they were on the bus by 8.15 like normal. Adeline was too young to go to school, so she was still home with Kenzie. So then around 9 a.m., some tree trimmers arrived to the house to do some work on the property. And according to them, they just got to work, started, you know, trimming trees. And then they look over and they saw that there was a little girl standing in the front door of the house, hysterically crying. The tree trimmer who noticed this was concerned, obviously, and walked over to her. And as he got closer, he realized that she was crying and screaming, my mom is dead. So this guy tries to comfort her and immediately calls 911. So police got there very quickly and they went into the house and they found Kenzie still in bed with blood all over and they thought that she actually just hemorrhaged. It wasn't until the coroner came in and actually started touching her body and looking closer that they realized that this was a murder. Kenzie was only 26 years old and she had been shot in the back of the head execution style 
in her bed. And of course that means her son, Christopher, also was murdered. And they tried to revive her, but there was nothing that they could do. So police called Chris and you know, he has only been at work for a little while. He just saw Kenzie, he just kissed her goodbye in bed. And then he finds out that she's dead. Someone has shot her inside their home. They didn't tell him exactly what had happened. They told him that there was a horrible accident and he needed to come home. So he rushed back and when he got there, they told him that Kenzie was gone and so was his unborn child. And Chris was devastated, understandably, and collapsed to the ground. They told me that her and the baby were gone and I remember collapsing in the yard. I lost it. They said that Chris was just stunned. He was in complete disbelief that this could happen. So of course they thought maybe Chris did it. So they immediately brought him in for questioning. I gave her a kiss, told her I loved her, she kissed me back and I left. But obviously once they talked to Chris, they were able to rule him out as a suspect pretty quickly. You know, he actually went to work. There's proof that he was at work during all of this. And they even checked his hands for gunpowder residue and there was none. So they immediately go to Jordan and Janessa's school and pull them both out of school and bring them into the police station. And both of them said that it was a normal morning, except for Jordan noted that there was a black truck outside of his house that he did not recognize. He knew that they had people coming and working on their house, so he thought it was just one of their trucks, but he noted that. Jordan and Janessa obviously were devastated to hear about what had just happened to Kenzie. I mean, this was shocking. They had just seen her. They had just said goodbye and left for school for the day. All of them were just in absolute shock. They went home that night and tried to be together as a family and start to cope with this, you know, stunning death. So they were all cuddling together. Chris said that he and Jordan fell asleep in each other's arms, just crying, terribly sad. And he said by some miracle, I think they were so exhausted and just shocked that they fell asleep, but they only were asleep for a little while before the police came back to their house and started pounding on the door at 3.30 in the morning. Chris went downstairs, answered the door and was really concerned, but hoping that they had some answers for him. But when they opened the door, they said they had an arrest warrant for Jordan, who was 11 years old. They took him from the house and Jordan was like half asleep, so confused, so traumatized by this day. And he had absolutely no idea what was going on, like had no understanding for what was happening at all. Chris said that he was super confused that his son was being considered a suspect in Kenzie's murder. I mean, it hadn't even like crossed his mind. And they took him at 11 years old down to the police station, interviewed him a bit, and then brought him to the county jail with the adults. But police said that they were confident that they had enough evidence that Jordan killed Kenzie before he went to school that morning in a jealous rage about the newborn baby. They took me to the police barracks and I was in there and then they took me straight to the county jail and I had no idea what was going. I wasn't with anybody, it was just a bunch of strangers. I didn't understand what was happening, I didn't know where I was at, like what was going on or anything. And Chris, as you can imagine, was just absolutely blown away by this. Like I said, this had never crossed his mind. I was mind blown. Jordan and Kenzie had never had issues in the past. He never knew his son to be violent or, you know, aggressive towards Kenzie in any way. So he was just completely stunned that this was happening. So you're probably wondering what evidence do the police have that this 11 year old shot his stepmother and then went to school like nothing happened. So the first bit of evidence that police said pointed to Jordan was the fact that Kenzie was shot with a single shotgun. They said that this was more of a crime of opportunity, like Jordan saw saw the gun available, saw that Kenzie was there, saw his dad wasn't home and decided to do it all at once without thinking about it much because this is really not an ideal weapon to use to murder someone. When you fire off a shotgun, the bullet breaks up into a bunch of little pieces. So it's not often used in murders. So they figure this is a mistake that a kid would make, that they wouldn't think this through very well. They also believed that this was a gun that was in the house. It was not something that a stranger walked up carrying a huge long rifle up to the house in broad daylight and did this. That just didn't make sense to them. But Chris owned a lot of guns, so there were plenty in the house that Jordan could have used. They had guns of all shapes and sizes. They were super into hunting and they also had a ton of ammunition. They even found a child size shotgun that was a gift to Jordan for Christmas that he used for hunting. And this is something that's very common, especially in areas like this. Many young people who live around really wooded foresty areas learn how to hunt when they're pretty young. So this isn't like anything strange 
range for this area. And when police were on the scene, they noticed that the small gun that belonged to Jordan seemed to still smell like it had been recently fired. Now, all this clearly doesn't necessarily prove that Jordan was the one who did it or that that gun even was used. But the other thing that they were really going off of was the fact that Jordan had changed his story when they interviewed him. The first time they interviewed Jordan, he said that there was a black truck outside of their house in the driveway and he thought it was just someone that was working on the house. The second time that they interview him, he says that there was someone in the truck and that they were wearing a hat and that they were ducking down. Now it's totally possible he could have just recalled more details. It could be possible he's recalling things wrong, um, but this was a apparently enough to the police to prove that he's a liar and that he did this, which is kind of crazy. I mean, he's 11 years old. How many kids do you know that change their stories when they tell a story over and over, you know, multiple times? How often do the details change? Pretty much always. They also brought up the fact that Janessa's interview was different than her first interview. And this was a big deal because when they interviewed Janessa a second time, she said not only did she see her brother messing around with the guns that morning, she also heard a big boom before they left for school, but she completely left this out of the initial interview. Now to this day, Jordan swears that he never touched the guns that day, but the police believed otherwise. They said that it was jealousy of the baby that would be coming into the family that drove Jordan to kill Kenzie and the baby. In my opinion, jealousy, jealousy of the impending birth. Police started talking a lot with Kenzie's family and they had quite a lot to say about Jordan. To this day, they have a lot to say about Jordan and they believe 100% that Jordan killed Kenzie that day. They said that Jordan wasn't the happy kid that everyone describes him as, that he seemed to be more of a troubled kid that had some dark underlying issues. He just seemed like he was a troubled kid. He just seemed like he wasn't like a real happy kid. I. I don't get it. So the police said that was some of their evidence. They also had taken a ton of Jordan's clothes from the house that day and they had found some gun powder residue on some of the clothes. However, Jordan had just attended this turkey shoot like a couple days before and he was wearing the same thing. So it easily could have been from that. Police ended up finding three 20 gauge shell casings outside of the house and one of them was found adjacent to the driveway in perfect condition. And police brought up that it's a little odd because when they had an interview with Jordan the second time, he talked about putting his hand into his pocket and pulling like some lint out of his pocket and throwing it on the driveway before he got on the bus. And police believe that he was talking about the shell casings. They thought that the whole story about bringing out the lint was just like a way of dealing with his guilt. I have a shotgun blast at the back of the head, consistent with a 20 gauge shotgun shell. I have a 20 gauge youth model in his room. It smells like it's recently fired and he's got gun residue. Uh, on him, I, I think that's at this point is more than enough. But Chris from the beginning said that there was no way his son had done this. Like he never believed that. He said there had to be another explanation that Jordan would never kill Kenzie, that he loved her. He was excited about having this baby in his life and he never knew his son to be violent. I know my son and I know if I ask him a question, if he's lying to me or not. An 11 year old couldn't plan her own birthday party, let alone, you know, to think that they could do something like that. So Chris ended up telling the police that there was another person that he thought possibly could have been involved and his name is Adam Harvey. Adam was Kenzie's ex-boyfriend of six years and Chris said that Kenzie was terrified of Adam. And get this, Kenzie even had protection orders against Adam. That's how scared she was of him. He had been really aggressive towards her in the past. He had made threats towards her. He said that he would kill her and her whole family. And that's how she was able to get that restraining order. And here's the kicker. Adam drives a black truck. Now Jordan would have no knowledge of this. He had no idea who Adam was, definitely had no idea what car he was driving. So the fact that he brought that up, the first interview, is hugely important. So police went and checked out Adam, but from the beginning, they were pretty sure it wasn't him. And the first reason that they say it could not have been him is because when they checked his truck, it still had snow on top of it. And they think that there's no way he could have driven 20 miles to Kenzie's and 20 miles back and still have snow on top of his truck. And here's something really interesting. When they first start talking to Adam, they realize that Adam had just found out some new information about Kenzie. For years, he was under the impression that he was the father of Adeline, but it turns out that he was not, and he had just 
found this out. He even expressed to the police how hard this was on him and how devastated he was to find this news out. So could this have been a reason that he would want to kill Kenzie? But Adam was really cooperative with the police, very friendly with them, and he did a polygraph test and it wasn't long before they ruled him out as a suspect completely. They said that there was just no way it all would have worked out. They said there was a chance that Adam didn't even know where Kenzie lived and that if he did, he would have to have this timed so perfectly. They said it would have been impossible for him to know that the doors were unlocked, that she was home alone, other than with Adeline, to know that there was a 20 gauge shotgun in the house. And they said with all the guys out there trimming the trees, that it would be impossible for him to get in the house without being seen and to shoot her and leave without any of them noticing. So Adam ended up being ruled out as a possible suspect. This means Jordan was the only suspect and they decided to move forward with his conviction. Meanwhile, while he's awaiting trial, he's being held at a juvenile detention center around 200 miles from Chris's house. So Chris is driving four hours to see his son as often as he can. And from the beginning, he is convinced that Jordan is innocent. There's no way that he killed Kenzie, that he loved Kenzie, that he would never do this to him. I mean, he loved his dad so much. If there's one person he loved in the world, it's his dad. Why would he want to take away his dad's child, his brother, his you know possible stepmom he's gonna have? Why would he do this to himself? It just did not make sense. And Chris said from the beginning, he would ask Jordan, you know, you can tell me, I'm your dad, just be honest with me. And he was always like 100%, I did not do it. I would never have shot Kenzie. So the two of them were hoping that he would be found innocent in a court of law. Now it's crazy in this case. And what I don't understand about the justice system is that some states, it works completely differently than others. I mean, we all know that, right? But especially when it comes to juvenile crimes. In Pennsylvania, murder is not considered to be a juvenile crime. So anyone who is being tried for murder is tried as an adult. So Jordan was gonna be tried as an adult at age 11. I just don't understand that. I personally believe that all children should be tried as children and adults should be tried as adults. Nationwide, period, but that's my personal opinion. So this case did pick up some media attention, but not the way I think it should have, because this was just crazy. If he was convicted, Jordan would be facing life in an adult prison without the possibility of parole. And he would be the youngest ever, ever to be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And in my opinion, there was just not nearly enough evidence to make that call. And this was obviously so hard on Jordan mentally to be away from his family, to be convicted of murder, to be carrying around that guilt when, you know, he may not have even done it. And then it was also hard for Chris because he's trying to be there for his son, but he's also trying to mourn the loss of Kenzie and his unborn child. But he had to stay strong and be there for Jordan and make sure he didn't end up in prison for the rest of his life for a murder he may not have committed. And sadly, Chris ended up losing his job because he was constantly having to leave to drive to this prison to see his son. Losing his job obviously took a huge toll on him financially and just having to go back and forth and travel, that all costs money. And this was an incredibly hard time for him. And Jordan, as you can imagine, was extremely stressed out and scared as an 11 year old in jail with people who are much older than him. I mean, he had 17 year olds around him that were violent, that were getting into fights. And he was seeing all kinds of stuff, hearing all types of language that you shouldn't at that age and genuinely felt scared for his life every day. I didn't understand anything at all what was going on. He'd say, Dad, he said, I, you wouldn't believe what I seen today. One kid threatened to stab another one in the neck, you know, while we were eating. The time went by in jail for Jordan and eventually on his 12th birthday, his dad got his whole old football team to come to the jail and celebrate with him. And Jordan said that meant the absolute world to him at the time to see everybody, I can't imagine. It was like the best day I ever had. <laughs> it was because I haven't seen my friends in so long and you know they all came up and we were there for a couple hours. And getting ready for this trial took a really long time. So Jordan spent years in juvie. Eventually he started taking some classes, but he said that he was mostly self-taught. And Jordan also loved to read. He got super, super into reading at this time, especially fantasy books, you know, that were like diving into a different reality when you open them, like 
anything to get him out of the reality he was in. I can't imagine how stressful and traumatic it is as a kid, especially if you didn't do it. I mean, the trauma from that alone would be so heavy for a child. And you'd think that maybe with some time, Jordan would eventually come around and tell the truth if he really did, you know, kill Kenzie. But to this day, Jordan swears that he never did anything to hurt Kenzie, that he never would have, and that he loves her. He still does, he still cares about her. He can't believe what had happened. And all of them wish so badly that they could reverse this and go back to the family and the life they were all supposed to live together. However, on the other side, Kenzie's family was completely convinced that Jordan did murder Kenzie, that he had a dark side to him that Chris was not willing to see. And hoping he's gonna be charged as an adult because that's what he is, he did an adult crime. Jordan's a murderer, and I'll say it. And his father needs to get in the mirror every morning and look in that mirror and say, I am the father of a murderer. And this is why I know this comment section is gonna be so all over the place. I know some people are gonna think that Jordan actually did do this, that it just doesn't make sense any other way. And of course, you know, when you hear Kenzie's family talking about how sure they are that Jordan did it, it makes you kind of wonder. They seem to be absolutely convinced and they wanted Jordan to receive the maximum punishment possible. And this was gonna mean that Jordan would have to be tried as an adult, but they are still arguing about this. So it wasn't until August of 2011 that a judge finally ruled that Jordan would not be tried as an adult. When you're tried as a juvenile, it's a much different process. There's a lot of different things in place. And the following year in 2012, they had the trial and it actually only lasted three days. And it was actually gonna be a bench trial, meaning the judge would be making the final decision. There's no jury. And on April 13th, 2012, at only age 14, Jordan was found guilty of double homicide. And this definitely riled up the community. I mean, people just did not think there was enough evidence to be sure that Jordan did this. Jordan's defense team felt like it was very unfair. They were convinced the judge got it wrong and that there was just not enough evidence to prove that Jordan did this. So they decided to take this all the way to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. So one of the biggest things that the police argued was the fact that they had smelled one of the guns when they had first gotten to the scene the small children's shotgun, and that it smelled like gunpowder. But they ended up finding out that the police who said this had absolutely no training or expertise when it comes to determining if a rifle had been shot. So this cannot be used as evidence. I mean, it just cannot. They also argued about the shell casing. They said that it just did not make sense to rule that the one that they had found was the one that was used in Kenzie's death because this family shot guns off on their property all the time. There were shell casings all over the place. So they couldn't necessarily prove that that was the one that was from her death. And when you're talking about someone's life in prison for a 14 year old, you gotta be sure, you've gotta have a lot better evidence than that. The defense also argued that there's just no way Jordan would have been able to pull this off without leaving any evidence especially if it was this unplanned thing. Let's walk through what this would have looked like, right? Jordan and Janessa would have been on the couch waiting to go to school. Jordan would have decided to go upstairs, get one of the guns, load the shotgun, bring it downstairs, shoot Kenzie in the head very calmly, very quickly, go upstairs, bring the gun back up there, unload it, and then leave for school like nothing happened without leaving any evidence at all at age 11. That's pretty wild. Is it possible? Maybe, but how can you be sure? How can you just put everything on a theory like that? And the biggest thing that they argued to the Supreme Court was that the police were not able to prove that that gun was even the one that was used to kill Kenzie. There was no way to prove that. The real gun might be out there somewhere. Maybe it was someone in a black truck and maybe they left with the gun that day. That's a very real possibility. And when you have a possibility like that, you can't just convict a child of murdering two people and sentence them to the rest of their life in prison on a theory, you know, without evidence, that's all it is. It's just a theory. There was also no blood found on the gun. There was no blood found anywhere outside of around Kenzie's head. There was no blood found on Jordan's clothes, which is really hard to believe considering this is a shotgun. You know, it makes quite a mess. Jordan's hands were never even tested for gunshot residue. They never even checked the house 
for fingerprints. So someone totally could have been in there. The door was just unlocked. There were people working on the property. How can they be so sure that no one else could have come into the house that day and done this? They just can't. There is no way to prove that. And when it came to Jordan's clothes being so clean, not having blood anywhere on him, the prosecution argued that that was because the blowback from the gunshot wound was actually stopped by Kenzie's hair that her hair blocked all of it. Our theory is that the blowback would have been stopped most of it, if not all of it, from the hair of Kenzie. Which really seems like one of the weakest arguments I've ever heard. So you might be wondering if they ever interviewed Adeline Moore. You know, she was standing in the doorway when they found out that Kenzie was dead. What did she see that morning? What did she hear? Well, it's hard because she was only four years old at the time, so she was not interviewed and it couldn't be considered credible anyway. But when she was 13 years old, she did an interview and she said that she heard something that morning, which at the time she did not know what it could be, but whatever it was, was loud enough to wake her up. She said she then went down to Kenzie's room, walked in there and Kenzie's phone was ringing. So she answered, and the person on the other line asked to talk with Kenzie. So that's when she tried to wake her mother up. She said that her mom wasn't responding. So she tried to kind of push her and that's when she rolled her over and realized she was dead and saw all of the blood, which I can't imagine what a traumatic experience that was. And when I turned her over, I realized. So I hung up the phone and I went outside. But according to her, she walked right outside as soon as she realized her mom was dead. She was so freaked out by the scene that she went outside immediately and started crying and that's when she got the attention of the tree trimmers. This was right around 9 a.m., which means Jordan and Janessa would already be at school. Remember, she said she heard the gunshot go off right before all this. So, you know, right leading up to nine, that was happening. Jordan and Janessa left for school around 8.15. So if her account of this is correct, that means Jordan wasn't even home when the murder happened. Of course, I have to point out that a lot of investigators do not believe her story because she was four at the time. I mean, it's hard to really take it as 100% the truth. So a lot of people dismiss her story and say that it doesn't count as part of the actual evidence, which I understand she was super, super young. So in summer of 2018, Jordan Brown's case was presented to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. They looked it over for a little while and then on July 18th, 2018, they decided to rule in Jordan's favor. They said that after reviewing everything, they could not prove him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So that was it. Jordan was set free right away. Imagine how he would have felt. And you know, obviously there were people celebrating, there were people really, really excited, but there's there are still to this day a lot of people that believe he got away with murder. Kenzie's whole family believes that he was the one that did it. And of course, no one can say that he didn't do it. There's no way to fully prove that either, but there's no way to fully prove he did. We can't be sending people to life in prison without enough evidence that they have actually committed the crime that they are accused of doing. Hopefully we can all agree on that. Especially when you have an 11 year old in such a murky situation. And of course I feel so badly for Kenzie's family and for Kenzie. And I wish so badly they could have the answers that they need because Chris believes that the real murderer is still running free. He believes that his unborn child and Kenzie were murdered by someone who got away with it and framed his son. There's a murderer walking amongst us that, uh has been overlooked. Chris is still heartbroken to this day that this happened. This has, you know, ruined their lives in so many ways, but he's very thankful now to have his son free. And Jordan has, you know, been able to really impress everybody with how strong he has been throughout all of this. Jordan was able to main a 3.9 GPA and also taught himself how to play guitar. He also played a lot of basketball in jail and has now become pretty good at it. And he's such a chill dude for what happened to him. When he's interviewed about this, he says that all of this that happened was BS, but you know, he's thankful that it's over now and he's out. I think the whole, like what happened and the way it happened is BS, but I don't think I'm angry. He has such a positive outlook for going through so much. And of course, I know there will be some of you that think that Jordan did this. And I'd like to hear your opinions because it is a hard one, but I definitely think at the end of the day, the right call was made here. Jordan should not have 
been found guilty of this murder. There's just not enough evidence, period. There's not. Chris is still very frustrated and disappointed with the police for pinning this on his son. And the police stayed very strong in their opinions that they got this right originally, that Jordan really did murder Kenzie and the baby and that he got away with it. But a lot of people have been very critical of the police for being so confident about this with not enough evidence to really back that confidence up. Also, they really didn't have much experience with murders at all when this was all happening. So it's it's really hard to just take their word for it. Kenzie's family, especially her daughters, really miss her and wish they knew what happened so badly. We used to like dance and sing on the fireplace. That was like my favorite memory. I'm just like her. I am her little mini me. Jordan ended up going to college and studied computer science. And recently he's actually gotten into criminal justice. He has started taking classes and is interested in potentially becoming a lawyer one day. Not only that, he specifically wants to work in civil rights, which I think is pretty cool. Most recently in July of 2020, it came out that Jordan and his legal team are suing a handful of retired state police investigators and officials, accusing them of malicious prosecution. So that is very interesting. And I bet there's some more to this story that we can't know about for legal reasons. Jordan and his attorneys say that police manipulated interviews, they manipulated evidence and pushed this false narrative from the beginning that Jordan had done it without any proof. You know, they just kind of went with that narrative from the beginning for some reason. Not only that, but they believe that they failed at following protocol for interviewing children when it comes to interviewing all of the kids involved in this case. Apparently there's a department policy that said that they should have recorded the first interview. They're also not supposed to have had multiple adults in the room during it. And they were not supposed to talk about the case details in front of the children. Absolutely no evidence. Uh, direct or circumstantial that ind indicating that Jordan Brown committed this crime. There was not a single piece of physical evidence. There was no DNA. There were no fingerprints. Uh, there was nothing. The family is also suing them for not pursuing Adam enough. They still think that it could have been him, which I feel like they didn't look into that enough either. It's so weird that they were so sure that it wasn't him right away, especially because she had that restraining order against him and it would have been possible for him to do it. Jordan's hoping that this lawsuit will be the thing that really kind of nails in his innocence for everybody. And he's also really hoping that they give his dad some financial compensation. His family in general should get something for all that he's been through. So that is all still, you know, kind of in the works. We'll see what happens with that. I'm curious what your opinions are. Do you think the police made the wrong call in the beginning or the right call in the beginning? Do you think it should have been reversed? I know there's gonna be a lot of opinions, so let me know your thoughts below, guys. I definitely wanna hear what you think. I found this case to be so interesting. It's one of those that just leaves me wondering what happened so bad. Uh, but I don't think we'll ever get the answers that we should have. It seems like the, the crime scene itself just was not processed well enough. And it's a shame when that happens. It really is. I feel so bad for Kenzie and that baby she lost, Christopher, you know, terribly sad. He didn't even get a, a start at life. I feel for Kenzie's family, even though, you know, they disagree with how all this turned out and they believe that Jordan got away with murder. Um, and I disagree with them in that I still feel incredibly sorry for them and their loss. I can't imagine how hard that this has all been for them. But that is it for me today, guys. Before I wrap up, I wanna thank today's sponsor, which is ExpressVPN. Every time you use the internet, big tech companies mine your data by tracking your searches, messages, and video history. But when you run ExpressVPN on your device, the software hides your IP address, which websites can use to personally identify you. That makes your activity more difficult to trace and sell to advertisers. ExpressVPN also encrypts 100% of your internet data to keep you safe from hackers and prying eyes. And many VPNs actually slow down your internet, but not ExpressVPN. They're incredibly fast and easy to use. Just tap one button and you're protected. So if you're like me and you don't like the idea of tech companies exploiting your personal information, then visit expressvpn.com slash Kendall Ray right now and find out how you can get three extra months of ExpressVPN for free. That's expressvpn.com slash Kendall Ray. I will have it linked below. Definitely go check that out, guys. But that's gonna be it for me today, guys. I hope you are having a great day. Stay safe and I will see you in the new year. Thank you.